Hello my friends, and welcome. This is a story about a pandemic that happened a little over 100 years ago, and of how, we here in Ireland, dealt with it. This pandemic struck Ireland between the spring of 1918 and the spring of 1919, claiming approximately 23,000 lives, and infecting 800,000 others. This all happened in just over 12 months. Worldwide, it's believed that over 50 million people succumbed to the virus. The pandemic came at a time of already massive upheaval, coinciding as it did with the end of the First World War. For a long time, it was very much considered an understudied event in our history as it was largely eclipsed in the collective memory by major military and political events. As with the current coronavirus pandemic, no community, no place, or aspect of life in our country was left unaffected by this devastating virus. With the recent centenary of the Spanish flu, the events of that period have been revisited, and it has also been given particular attention in recent times due to its parallels with the current crisis. Looking back over the social, economic, medical and political history of the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic in Ireland, it is a gripping story of a society silenced as the disease passed through towns and townlands, with commerce, court cases and normal life disrupted, events cancelled, and community soup kitchens set up to feed the ill. A story of families suffering terrible losses, of orphaned children and ongoing physical, economic and emotional damage. First-hand accounts of the impact of the Spanish flu on Irish society were recorded by the Irish Folklore Commission in the late 1930s. The Commission worked with the Department of Education and the Irish National Teachers Organisation, to encourage children from 5,000 schools across Ireland to collect folklore from their own areas. The guidebook circulated to schools for the project contained 55 essay topics including local cures, local place names, the care of our farm animals. Pupils were also asked if there was a local tradition of a fairy horse or cow, which came into a farmer's possession and remained for a certain time, and of any sightings or encounters with strange animals. The latter asking is there a story told in your district of a serpent or large animal which lives in a certain lake or river there. Under local happenings, children were asked of any plagues or epidemics which visited the district and to give accounts of their causes, cause, and harm done. The collection gives us a unique insight into life in Ireland during the Spanish flu pandemic and offers many parallels between events of that time and the current coronavirus pandemic. The flu came in two forms, one a mild type of illness, the second more severe. Dying patients sometimes had temperatures as high as 109 degrees Fahrenheit, became unconscious and twitched frequently. They usually died between the 6th and 11th days of the disease. From the middle of July, the first wave of the flu started to recede. Everyone thought that the pandemic was over, and life seemed to be going back to normal. But, when the second wave struck in October 1918, it was clear to most, that the country was in the grips of a severe flu pandemic. Like the first wave, Leinster and Ulster were the areas most affected by the second wave. This wave was far more destructive than the first. There were many reports of unimaginable horrors inflicted on whole families. There was a case of a man in Clontarf returning home after burying his two sons to find his wife dead too. In Enniscorthy in Wexford, three young children from the one family died on the same day. Schools in Dublin City and suburbs were severely affected and were closed down. October and November of 1918 saw a paralysis in trade. Several people were falling on the streets in Cork. Schools were closed. Dances and concerts were banned. Public meetings were cancelled and wakes were no longer held. A village, in Sligo had apparently had no cases of the Spanish flu until after St. Patrick's Night in 1919, when a concert was held in the village hall. 
The next day every single person who was at the concert was down with the flu, and the organizers were blamed. Home remedies are often mentioned, with whiskey believed to have been particularly beneficial. Local doctors were rushed off their feet, and their exploits sometimes got a mention. The people of Walterstown, near Screen, County Meath, were apparently left largely unaffected due to the diligent Dr. Byrne. In the same district, whiskey was found to be a great remedy for the sickness, and indeed, it is claimed that the confirmed drunkards recovered, but the teetotalers died. According to an account from Tallow, County Waterford, onions could be used for various ailments. One cure was to draw out a sickness, cut an onion in two halves and put one half in one corner of the room in which the person is sick and put the other half in one of the three other corners. The onion will attract the germ. Another was to fill the house with sheep, as a disinfectant, used in the case of scarlet fever, with the sheep's breath allegedly killing the germs. Not surprisingly, holy wells and local saints also featured in local responses to the pandemic. One well in County Leitrim was said to cure any sickness, in man or beast. Whilst a well, in County Wexford could cure measles. People visited this well during the flu epidemic and it was claimed that no one in the area died of the illness. The parish of Kilkeven in County Roscommon was said to have been protected from the disease by St. Kevin who came to the River Suck and spread out his mantle and prophesied that any dangerous, infectious disease, would not have any effect on the district. There was very little consensus within the medical profession on what was the most effective treatment for the flu. A mixture of whiskey and hot water with sugar was the most widely available. Non-prescription medicines were in high demand as people self-medicated during the pandemic. Huge quantities of tonics, cough medicines and poultices were sold by pharmacies. Bovril and other beef teas like Oxo were very popular too. Despite all the tonics promoted and sold, bed rest and nursing were still considered the best way of beating the flu. By the end of the spring of 1919, the flu finally ran its brutal course. It had caused huge devastation throughout the country. An official figure of 20,057 deaths were recorded as being caused by flu during the three waves, although this is likely to be a conservative figure. There were also a lot more deaths from pneumonia. An excess figure of 3,231 deaths from pneumonia in 1918 and 1919, which also can be attributed to the influenza pandemic giving a figure of at least 23,288 deaths, directly related, to the pandemic. As in the current crisis, the public responded with widespread compliance, mixed with more than a hint of grumbling, pushback, and even outright defiance. As the days turned into weeks turned into months, the strictures became harder to tolerate, theatre and dance hall owners complain about their financial losses. Clergy bemoan church closures, while offices, factories and in some cases even saloons are allowed to remain open. Officials argued whether children were safer in classrooms or at home. Many citizens refused to wear face masks while in public, some complaining that they were uncomfortable, and others arguing that the government had no right to infringe on their civil liberties. As familiar as it all may sound in 2022, these are real descriptions of the island during the deadly 1918 influenza pandemic. As the COVID-19 pandemic enters its third year, many people want to know when life will go back to how it was before the coronavirus. History, of course, isn't an exact template for what the future holds. But the way Ireland emerged from the earlier pandemic could suggest what post-pandemic life will be like this time around. People clamoured to return to their normal lives. Businesses pressed officials to be allowed to reopen. Believing the pandemic was over, state and local authorities began rescinding public health edicts. The nation turned its efforts to addressing the devastation influenza had wrought. For the friends, families and co-workers of the tens of thousands of Irish who had died, post-pandemic life was filled with sadness and grief. 
many of those still recovering from bouts of the malady, which we now know today to be post-traumatic stress disorder, required support and care as they recuperated. For the vast majority of Irish citizens, life after the pandemic seemed to be a headlong rush to normalcy. Starved for weeks of their nights on the town, sporting events, religious services, classroom interactions and family gatherings, many were eager to return to their old lives. Taking their cues from officials who had, somewhat prematurely, declared an end to the pandemic. Ireland's people overwhelmingly hurried to return to their pre-pandemic routines. They packed into movie theatres and dance halls, crowded in stores and shops, and gathered with friends and family. Officials had warned the nation that cases and deaths likely would continue for months to come. The burden of public health, however, now rested not on policy but rather on individual responsibility. Predictably, the pandemic wore on, stretching into a fourth wave hitting in the winter of 1920. Some officials blamed the resurgence on careless citizens. Others downplayed the new cases or turned their attention to more routine public health matters, including other diseases, restaurant inspections and sanitation. Despite the persistence of the pandemic, influenza quickly became old news. Once a regular feature of front pages, reportage rapidly dwindled to small, sporadic clippings buried in the backs of the nation's newspapers. The nation carried on, inured to the toll the pandemic had taken and the deaths yet to come. People were largely unwilling to return to socially and economically disruptive public health measures. Our predecessors might be forgiven for not staying the course longer. First, the nation as was the rest of the world was eager to celebrate the recent end of World War I. Second, death from disease was a much larger part of life in the early 20th century and scourges such as diphtheria, measles, tuberculosis, typhoid, whooping cough, scarlet fever and pneumonia, each routinely killed thousands of Irish every year. Moreover, neither the cause nor the epidemiology of influenza was well understood, and many experts remained unconvinced that social distancing measures had any measurable impact. Finally, there were no effective flu vaccines to rescue the world from the ravages of the disease. In fact, the influenza virus would not be discovered for another 15 years, and a safe and effective vaccine was not available for the world's general population until 1945. Given the limited information they had and the tools at their disposal, Ireland perhaps endured the public health restrictions for as long as they reasonably could. A century later, and entering a third year into the COVID-19 pandemic, it is understandable that people now are all too eager to return to their old lives. The end of this pandemic inevitably will come, as it has with every previous one humankind has experienced. If we have anything to learn from the history of the 1918 influenza pandemic, as well as our experience thus far with COVID-19, it is that a premature return to pre-pandemic life risks more cases and more deaths. And today's Irish have significant advantages over those of a century ago. We have a much better understanding of virology and epidemiology. We know that social distancing and masking work to help save lives. Most critically, we have multiple safe and effective vaccines. Sticking with all these coronavirus fighting factors, or easing of them, could mean the difference between a new disease surge, and a quick end to the pandemic. COVID-19 is much more transmissible than influenza, and several troubling SARS-CoV-2 variants are already spreading around the globe. The deadly third wave of influenza in 1919 shows what can happen when people prematurely relax their guard. And that my friends is how we coped in the 1918 influenza pandemic. Goodbye for now. Please take care, and thank you, for watching another one of my little stories about Ireland's, twisted, history.